started recording as well. So welcome to our uh, May Behavioral Talk. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Thanos Vostanis, lecturer at the Tizard Center, University of Kent, where we offer two uh, MSCs in Applied Behavior Analysis and Positive Behavior Support, that they are ABEI verified, and we also have a UK SBA pathway nowadays for those of you who are interested in pursuing certification in the United Kingdom. Our courses have campus based and distance learning options, um, which I'm hoping that most of you are aware of. Uh, Tizard Center focuses on intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we also have a peer reviewed journal. Uh, it's called Tizard Learning Disability Review, and we do welcome submissions from folks working in learning disability or intellectual disability services, if you want to use a more international term. I always say, folks, and I'll say it again, if you have a nice case study, if you have a policy review, if you've got a proper experimental uh, project that you want to uh, get published and you want practitioners to read about, by all means, do submit that these are learning disability review. We also have a nice upcoming special issue that is now uh, gradually getting published as online first, uh, focusing on uh, the good work conducted by the Charlotte Foundation, which is a research group focusing on applied behavior analysis here in the United Kingdom. And the special issue focuses on the good work that they do researching applied behavior analysis here in the UK. We also have mailing lists and you will find in your CU form a link where you can sign up to the Tizard News mailing list. And this is to um, uh, give you more information about the work that we do. OK, today we welcome Dr. Castillo Suarez, who is going to be discussing um, ethics. Um, and that's why we're giving an ethic CU. Usually we give a good old type two or learning CU, but today it's an ethics CU. Keep in mind, we're go I'm going to give you three keywords. I'm going to interrupt Victoria during the session at three points, and I'm going to deliver a keyword. Make note of those keywords. And at the end of the session, I will post a link. It will take you to a Microsoft form. You can put your details in that along with the three keywords, and then I will prepare your certificate. We are recording this and it's going to go on YouTube, but we only offer a CU for synchronous attendance, which means that if for any reason you watch this at a later point, you won't be able to claim the CU. Dr. Suarez Castillo, not Castillo Suarez. Sorry, Vic, got the, Either the way. order of the it's, last names wrong. Either way, it's, all right. It's totally fine, yes. Thank you so much. So, I appreciate the introduction. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I will start by asking you to talk to us about something that you're currently working on that you're keen to share with the audience and then take it away. I'll be here monitoring the chat and delivering the keywords. Thank you again. Sure. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I guess I'll start by sharing about some exciting work that we're doing. <clears throat> My students and I related to a kind extinction approach to functional communication training. So recently, if you're in the field of behavior analysis, which I would imagine that most people here are, you've probably heard about kind extinction, which is a procedural variation to trad traditional extinction where you're providing compassionate statements to the learner as you're implementing an extinction procedure to have a more compassionate care approach and sort of alleviate some of the distress that comes with undergoing extinction conditions. And so what we're doing within my students' work is extending that kind extinction approach into functional communication training. So functional communication training is a really foundational procedure that we use within disability services. It's really like the go to way to teach communication and we use it all the time. And so it would make sense to extend that kind of extinction approach into something that's so commonly used like functional communication training. So that's something that we're working on that we're really excited about. We're actually recruiting participants. So if you have learners or students that you think could benefit from the protocol, we'd love to have you participate in our research and implement our protocol with your students. So I'll share my contact information at the end and feel free to reach out if that's something that you would be interested in participating in and that you feel your clients or learners could benefit from. So with that, I'll jump into today's topic, which is how to make ethical decisions and specifically discussing an ethical decision making model that's informed by literature across healthcare disciplines. Now, before I get into 
all of the presentation. I do want to say thank you so much for having me to the University of Kent. It's very exciting to be able to share our work and especially to be able to disseminate it internationally. Um, this was completed in the US. I live in the US. My research is completed here. So it's very exciting to be able to have an international platform to share our work. And it's very encouraging to have so many participants attend. So thank you so much. So I'll give sort of an overview of what you can expect from this talk and sort of the directions in which it will go. So I'll start by first discussing ethics as it relates to decision making behavior. And I'll talk about the available ethical decision making models that have been published within our field. So within the field of behavior analysis. Then I'll describe my colleagues and my research where we evaluated literature from different healthcare and allied disciplines on ethical decision making models and sort of walk you through what that research process was and what our findings were. And then I'll end with talking about how our studies findings align with the model that's within the BACB ethics code and how you can use the findings from our research to really incorporate into your everyday practice when you're making ethical decision making and really how these can apply to behavior analysts of any level, whether you're an RBT, a BCBA, a clinical director, a practitioner, and so on. So starting with ethics as decision making. When we think of ethics as decision making, we want to consider that ethical decision making is essentially this operant behavior that involves a complex chain of responses. So we probably all know what operant behavior is. Anytime that we think about operant behavior, we know that this is behavior that's been learned via consequences or via contingency shaping or accessing that three term contingency. And when we think about a behavior chain, we recognize that a behavior chain means that each previous step functions as the discriminative stimulus for the following step, and then each following steps serve as reinforcement for the previous steps, and so we have that intertwined functional relationship. Meaning that when it comes to ethical decision making, there is a functional relationship between the series of behaviors that are involved in actually coming to ethical decisions and also the consequences that are involved in those behaviors. Now, to learn this operant behavior of ethical decision making, typically behavior analysts get training from responding to ethical scenarios or vignettes. Usually this happens as a part of your coursework, whether it's at the university level or if you're doing a verified course sequence to obtain your coursework hours. And most typically this practice happens by using textbooks or workbooks. Common ones are Bailey and Birch, Sasha Nadowski. Those have ethical vignettes within them that you can use for practice. Now, what's interesting to think about is that these workbooks are somewhat newer. They've been published only within the last five years. And so when I reflect back on my own coursework training, which was much more than five years ago, I don't necessarily recall practicing the skill of working through or solving ethical dilemmas using some sort of tool or engaging in some sort of behaviors. And where I'm trying to go with this is to say that for many behavior analysts, studying the ethics code alone is what primarily made up our ethical decision making training, which left only real world or real life experiences to be the opportunities in which we practice the skill of actually going through this chain of behaviors. And then that response was ultimately or is ultimately refined and developed through this sort of on the ground training, which probably isn't the most optimal way to develop develop this sound operant skill repertoire. So whether we're using textbook scenarios or vignettes, or we're practicing within the real world when we experience ethical conflicts ourselves, this is ultimately a multiple exemplar training approach, right? We have multiple examples that we're working through, ultimately having multiple types of opportunities to practice ethical decision making. And while this is great and can promote generalization, the issue becomes that there's really unique contextual variables to each specific ethical situation that can impact how you respond or how you ultimately should respond. So some things like the impact on stakeholders or specific organizational variables or the perspective of the funding source are all going to be really unique to each situation and can't necessarily always be captured within something like a workbook text or vignette. 
So to be really good at making ethical decisions, it's really important that these unique contextual variables are considered, which ultimately requires the behavior chain of ethical decision making to include this consideration. Now, interestingly, the BACB ethics code itself now offers a decision making tool. However, no previous iteration ever did. It wasn't until 2020 that the BACB published the updated ethics code that now includes essentially a behavior chain or decision making model that can be used by clinicians and practitioners to help them work through ethical scenarios. Now, the tool that's included in the current code is an 11 step model. We'll review it and discuss it more later on during this presentation. If you're not familiar with it, you can search the BCBA ethics code for behavior analysts and find that the most recent 2020 iteration includes that decision making model. So now let's talk about actual decision making models. So given the uniqueness of ethical situations, how important it is to carefully consider the variables of each ethical dilemma, decision making models specifically offer a sort of task analysis, so to speak, of steps that we can engage in to help promote and support sound ethical decision making. And decision making models specific to ethical decision making really give us a tool that we can use to navigate complex ethical dilemmas. So they're really useful and almost necessary when it comes to ethical decision making. The benefit of using and learning from models and learning how models can be used to support decision making is that it really allows us to pick apart the variables that are unique to a given scenario and sort of apply them within that task analysis and remove some of the influence of our learning history so that we can ensure that we're making a decision that's tailored to the situation at hand and not necessarily shaped by perhaps our previous experiences or responses. So it's really interesting to think about how the existing peer reviewed models that we have within behavior analytic research and, and literature have all emerged within just the last seven years. So somewhat recently, but seven years is also a fair amount of time to be around, yet they're not necessarily universally published. They're not taught across all programs. We kind of just have sprinkles of models here and there that have existed within our literature. And like I mentioned, it wasn't until the 2020 updated ethics code that we now have sort of this one model that is more universally disseminated and can be more widely accessed. It's also really important to consider that the available ethical decision making models that we have within the literature at this point within our field, within the field of behavior analysis, are giving us only a discipline specific approach. And we know from our work in disability services that it's really not just our discipline that needs to be considered. We're typically working with other providers, other stakeholders, and there's kind of a need for a more interprofessional type of approach to our decision making, especially when it comes to ethical problems. So when we think about the fact that these models that we have up to this point or that we've had up to this point were made by behavior analysts for behavior analysts, we can kind of see how there might be some room to lean into what other professions are doing or have done and learn from some of the work that has essentially come before us. So that's where we get to considering available models beyond our own field. Of course, it's great to have ethical models that are made by and for behavior analysts, but like I mentioned, there's definitely benefit to looking beyond our own field's literature. Specifically, when we think about how allied fields are much older than we are as a field, we're probably one of the newest sciences, especially when we compare to like medicine and psychology who have like hundreds of years of literature under their belt, we can really learn from what's been done before and sort of these more seasoned disciplines that have a longer history of publishing on these topics. It's also really useful to consider how we've recently seen more and more calls to action within the literature for behavior analysts to look to and learn from related professions. Learning from these other fields is really beneficial because it can help our own fields development, help us approach things from a more interprofessional perspective, and also just let us learn from like the mistakes that other people have made or from the positive impacts that other fields have had with the work that they've done. So that's ultimately what led to our research. We wanted to see what types of ethical decision making models exist beyond our own 
field literature and what are some of the themes that arise within that literature. So what we did is within our research, we conducted a systematic literature review and we also conducted a descriptive analysis of ethical decision making models from both behavior analysis and allied disciplines. And what we did throughout this process is identify similarities and differences in the approaches to ethical decision making that ultimately could better inform our own field's approach to making ethical decisions, teaching ethical decision making as an operant repertoire, and coming up with a model that's supported by an array of literature across disciplines. So I'll go over the method of our research. I will disclose that I'm leaving out some details, but the manuscript is published, so you can always access it. I'm happy to share it if you want further details than what I'll provide today for the sake of time. But I'll share overall what the research looked like and sort of what the process entailed. So our research took place during July of 2020 and all the way through August of 2021. That's when we were completing the search, going through all the literature and sort of sorting through what was out there. We decided to search literature from the fields of applied behavior analysis, education, medicine, occupational therapy, psychology, social work, and speech language pathology. And we really took careful consideration when coming up with this list of which disciplines we thought would offer some valuable resources for us. And we decided on these and ultimately chose these as the fields to sort through their literature because of the ways in which they're similar to behavior analysis's mission of serving vulnerable populations and supporting vulnerable students and learners and clients in skill development or symptom remediation, which is ultimately what we do within service delivery of behavior analysis. For the type of review that we completed, we used the PRISMA guidelines. Like I mentioned, for the sake of time, I won't go over the PRISMA guidelines. You can read all about them, but it's essentially a systematic way of sorting through literature. It includes various steps like searching through databases, doing manual reference scans, running numbers and things of that sort. But essentially what we did is we went through all of the literature from these fields and we found papers that talked about ethical decision making and included ethical decision making models. And then we looked for the similarities and differences between those models. And I'll go over some more details of sort of what that entailed in the coming slides. So to actually search for papers or for literature, we used the psych info database. Psych Info is a database that's um, owned by the American Psychological Association, and it includes literature from both the field of psychology, but also related psychology aspects and related disciplines like medicine and social sciences. And we chose that as a database because it's a very well, um, it's a very complete database. It includes research from many fields and is very well known for being a, a dense database. So what we did is that we went to PsychInfo and we searched a variety of keywords like ethics, decision making, model, and we combined those words with medicine, nursing, applied behavior analysis and all the different fields. That search yielded 589 articles. So when we went to PsychInfo, when we plugged in like decision making, ethics, medicine, decision making, ethics, behavior analysis, decision making, ethics, blah, blah, ran all the combinations, we came up with 589 articles. So then with those 589 articles, what we looked for is that they included words within their titles or abstracts related to ethics and decision making. And from there, we found 173 articles that actually included within their titles that they were specific to ethics or decision making or within their abstracts that they were specific to ethics and decision making. For the papers that actually did have those words mentioned within their titles or abstracts, we then pulled those, which was the 173 articles, and we read the entirety of the 173 to evaluate them further. So what happened next is that we took these 173 articles and we read them completely to evaluate for five things. One, we evaluated that they included humans as the population of interest that they mentioned decision making explicitly, that they mentioned ethics also, 
and that they actually provided a model and specifically addressed how to respond to ethical dilemmas, either by describing steps that one should take, by providing some sort of visual, or having just any mention of this is how you can solve ethical problems. All of the articles that met these five criteria were then set aside to be included within our detailed analysis. So hey, after we- Can mm -hmm. I interrupt you for a sec, just yeah, to deliver the course. first keyword? Okay, yes, thank please. You. Guys, the first keyword is review. The first keyword is review. Thank you. And I will say too, if anybody has any questions as I'm going along, feel free to use the chat. I have it open. I might miss it, but I can always come back to it. If anything comes up that you're curious about or that you'd want to ask, feel free to type that into the chat for sure as we go along. So what happened next is after we reviewed all the articles across those five criteria, we had 60 that met the five criteria and ended up actually being included in the analysis. So what happened next is that for these 60 articles, we analyzed them across dependent measures. So essentially what we did is that we analyzed four things across the 60 articles. In other words, we pulled out information related to four measures in each of the 60 articles. So specifically what we looked for is the specific steps that were included within the models of the article. Then we categorized the models by their corresponding profession or discipline to see where they came from. We also categorized whether the model that was included was linear versus sequential, meaning it was a model that needed to be followed within a specific order or not. And then finally, we evaluated whether the model included a problem solving approach, which meant that it encouraged the user to come up with multiple solutions and then make a decision based on considering the possible outcomes of the multiple generated solutions. And so as we read the 60 articles, what we did is we started to note common steps that we observed within the models of the paper. So it was like we were reading the papers and we were seeing, oh, this step is coming up again and this step is coming up again. Let's add it to the list of steps that we're seeing come up over and over again. And what happened from doing that is that we developed sort of a list of steps that we're seeing come up often. And once we had this list going of steps that were coming up often, we were then going back and coding like which articles are including which steps. And I'll show you sort of a more detailed breakdown of the numbers that ended up with that. But for here, I want to really describe the common steps that we saw published across the 60 articles that were coming from different fields. Ultimately, there were nine steps kind of grouped into some smaller steps, which you can see in this visual. But really what was coming up frequently that we saw is the reported steps that were included really often throughout the literature was one the mention of some ethical radar or trigger. That included an urgent detour to where if there was an a problem that included some sort of legal issue or some sort of, you know, abuse that re that required reporting, it would require some sort of urgent detour in the direction of, of the decision. Then there was the common step of pinpointing exactly what the problem was. Also gathering information related to the specific case and the specific issue at hand going through available options and behaviors that you could engage in sort of ranking and weighing what can be done in a sort of a risk benefit analysis implementing that decision of what you're going to do and then ultimately following up were the common steps that we saw throughout now when we identified these common steps like i said we ran numbers so to speak to see out of these 60 papers how many were actually including each step so what we found is that gathering information was included in 20% of the papers. So 11 papers actually explicitly talked about information gathering as a critical step. Considering affected parties was one that was included pretty much in almost all the papers. 89% of the papers talked about considering people involved and people who would be affected by the decision making of that problem or that dilemma. 73% of the papers talked about referring to the code specific to that field, the ethics code related to that field, which makes sense. A large amount also related to 
deciding what you're going to do based on available options or behaviors. So 89% of the papers talked about looking at what available behaviors or options you have and making a decision based on really weighing out what possibilities there are. A really great amount, 93% discussed this ranking and weighing step where you really do sort of a risk benefit analysis of these different possible options that you could follow through with or decide on to solve the problem. And then about half, 47% discussed this follow-up step where after the problem has been solved, you kind of come back to see what the outcome was and what the result was. When it came to the analysis of the disciplines from which the models came from, kind of like a we expected it, no duh, was that most of the models came from the field of medicine. This makes sense. Medicine is the oldest field. It has a plethora of research across so many different topics. And of course, ethics is super important within medicine and patient care that's provided by physicians and nurses medical providers in general. So you can kind of see the breakdown within this medicine bar that you can see here. It included multiple aspects of medicine, like nursing, oncology, psychiatry, internal medicine, family medicine, emergency medicine. So it was really clustered around these different subfields, but we grouped them all together to really demonstrate that most of the literature came from medicine overall. The next most included field that had the most literature on this topic was psychology. Also kind of makes sense. Psychology has a very long history and a very fair amount of literature published on ethics as well as other topics. Psychology also included multiple subfields like psychiatry, counseling, pediatric psychology, school psychology, and so on, all clustered around the main field of psychology offering a good amount of literature. And then we saw other fields with a little bit less contributions in terms of literature, but still offering some literature to analyze, which included OBM, education, youth child care, and business. And when it came to problem solving, more of the models actually did not have a problem solving approach included within their model description. So 42% of the models did include a problem solving approach. We actually listed out the exact models that included it here within this display. So it's kind of a big bar graph where you can see the actual papers themselves that did include a model that had problem solving versus not. And, you know, it makes sense to me that making an ethical decision actually involves problem solving, which is interesting because most of the models didn't actually include a problem solving approach. But as behavior analysts, you know, when we think about problem solving and we think of like Skinner's description of problem solving, it involves manipulating variables to make an available solution become more salient within the evocative discriminative stimuli, which is kind of exactly what you're doing when you're solving an ethical problem. You're kind of like moving variables around to help you generate a solution that's going to essentially cause the least amount of harm to the least amount of people. So we don't really know if we need a problem solving approach. These models just sort of show us what's out there. And what we know is that it's kind of split, but for the most part, most of the available models don't necessarily include a problem solving approach. And when we discuss a problem solving approach, we're talking about the specific mediating behavior of generating multiple available solutions and then picking one based on the one that's going to lead to the most fruitful outcome. So like I mentioned, we don't know of any research that really directly compares the effectiveness of a model that includes versus doesn't include problem solving. We just sort of know what's out there. Now, it could also be that some types of ethical problems do require problem solving versus others might not, perhaps depending on the complexity. We just sort of have a, a display here of what's out there. Then when it comes to linear versus sequential models, 95% of the models were sequential in nature versus only three total models were not. So it's pretty clear that ethical decision making does require that we complete steps in a specific order, sort of like from a start to finish type of situation. And we can't really go through the order arbitrarily or without some sort of rhyme or reason to the way that we're coming to the decision. 
Now, what was really interesting to us is that the actual order of the steps across all of these sequential models was totally different. Like, it's not like they were on the same page on like what you need to do first versus last. They all had similar steps, but they weren't all necessarily in the same order. So what the literature is ultimately telling us is like there is a sequence that needs to be followed. Now, what the correct sequence is, who knows, because we also have a little bit of everything sprinkled within the available literature. But what these findings do show us is that there is consensus within the literature about ethical decision making requiring a sequential process. So this slide can look really intimidating. Bear with me. This is where things got really interesting. So we began and completed this literature search before the BACB published their 2020 code. So what happened was we completed our search. We had all our findings. We ran all our numbers. We're writing up our manuscript. It's 2020, OK? Actually, it was like almost 2021. And suddenly, the BACB publishes the updated code. And it includes a model. And we're like, oh my god, the new code has a model. Like. How does the model compare to what we've found over the past two years? And it was so cool to see that the BACB's model totally aligned with the steps that we found across the 60 articles from our analysis. So what we decided to do was sort of make a table to display where you can see the overlap between the BACB's 11 step model, which is displayed on the left here, and the steps that we found as common steps within our review, which is demonstrated on the right. So basically, our findings suggest that we as a field of behavior analysis have built a model that is entirely aligned and built upon an interprofessional database. So I'll take a closer look for us at sort of how these align. So if we're looking at the left side, we see that that is the BACB's ethical decision making model. They start with step one, which is to clearly define the issue and consider potential risk of harm to relevant individuals. This step one we found directly aligns with the first three common steps that we identified from our review, which includes the ethical radar, which is identifying that something just doesn't feel right. The urgent detour, which is if there's some sort of legal reporting issue that needs immediate addressing, that takes precedent. And then actually pinpointing or specifying what the exact issue is. So we see the overlap between these three steps and the step one indicated by the BACB. For step two of the BACB's model, they in indicated that we have to identify all the relevant individuals. This directly aligns with considering infor affected parties and information gathering. All of these steps also seem to align. So they mentioned that we need to gather relevant supporting documentation and follow up on secondhand information. Also sort of goes with this information gathering step. Consider your personal learning history is a really cool um, inclusion that the BACB's model put in there. We mentioned in the beginning of this talk how our learning history really plays a role and how the ways in which our behavior has been shaped through experience can sort of bleed into the decisions that we make within ethics. So that was important to include there. Then we have identifying the core principles of the code and standards. This overlaps with referring to professional codes or other codes of ethics. And then we have looking at specific resources that you could consult, which can be referencing other codes or even looking at case specific information. From there, if we look at step seven of the BACB's model, they incorporate that problem solving approach where they ask that we develop possible actions to remove or reduce risk and prioritize accordingly. This bleeds in with our identified common step five, which was to look at the available options or behaviors. The BACB's step eight is to critically evaluate each possible action and consider its alignment with the overall values of the code, potential impact, likelihood of resolving, and so on. This overlaps with our commonly identified step of that ranking and weighing. Step nine of the BACB ethics code is to select an option that seems most likely to resolve the concern. 
that overlaps with the analysis piece that we found as a common step, which was synthesizing the steps to make a decision. Step 10 of the BACB's code is to actually take the selected action and collaboration with relevant individuals and sort of implement it, overlaps with the implementation step that we found. And then finally, their 11th step is to evaluate the outcomes, which overlaps with follow up. So although it's a totally different model, when we sort of put the side by side of what the BACB published and the common steps that we found, we see that it totally aligns and they're essentially recommending very similar, almost identical steps. Now, although decision making models can be field specific, Ethical dilemmas we know have been shown from this interprofessional database that we've searched to be universal, meaning that everyone sort of has the same intended outcome, which is to do the least amount of harm to the least amount of people and make sure that you're going through a sound step of decisions to sound step of basically things to consider to come to a really sound ethical decision. So it's really cool to recognize that our own field offers this 11 step decision making model that we can quickly pull up by searching on our phones or having printed out our ethics code and that it really does align with the literature from so many different various fields that span a really long historical um, sort of publishing history. Now, it's going to be really important, though, to empirically evaluate this new model. So, yes, it's great. The BACB is giving us an 11 step model. It aligns with what other fields have been publishing about for years. But what's really interesting is that few, if any, ethical decision making models of the ones that we found have any empirical validation, meaning that the literature from both within and outside our field is giving us these recommendations of steps that we should engage in and how we should solve ethical problems, but there's no research that's actually proven or studied the effectiveness of these models. So like, how do we teach them? How do they work? Do they work? Do we need all the steps? Can we only do some of the steps? We don't know. So essentially, the question worth a million bucks, so to speak, is where do we go from here? If we know that we have a good decision making model that's available from our field, we know that other fields are suggesting that we do similar things to what our own ethics code is suggesting. How do we incorporate this into our practice while we consider that there's kind of no proof to show that this model really makes us any better or worse at coming to ethical decisions? So I'll end with sort of some applications that you can consider. I, I guess I can call these recommendations of ways that you can enhance your decision making using the model that's available to us. My first recommendation is related to ethical decision making as fitness. So this has been Victoria, published. In, yes. Be, before you crack on with this, let me just deliver uh -huh. the second keyword so I don't interrupt you later. Yes, please. Uh, guys, the second keyword is code. The second keyword is code. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this idea of ethical decision making as fitness, not something I came up with myself. It's been published before. I believe Bailey and Birch mentions it. I believe um, LeBlanc and colleagues have also mentioned it. But it essentially means that ethical decision making as an operant repertoire requires repeated consistent access to practice this overall skill set of a behavior. So similar to how physical fitness requires that you repeatedly and consistently engage in activities to enhance either your cardio endurance or your physical strength, decision making is the same idea. Like you're not going to get better at it unless you practice it. So one way that you can do this is by using the model, the 11 step model within the code to work through scenarios or vignettes. You can use workbooks like the Session Nadowski workbook or the Bailey and Birch workbook, which is what we see many coursework programs doing, essentially using these workbooks as tools to help us practice navigating through dilemmas. The key here though is using the model each time. So really going through the model on repeat so it can kind of become something that you do covertly in your head type of thing where you can visualize the steps and go through them readily as you're solving ethical decision or ethical dilemmas. 
Now we can also do this by considering previous ethical situations that we've run into and sort of working through the BACB's model, thinking back to previous situations and reflecting on how we worked through those situations in the moment versus what we maybe would have done differently according to the model use if we'd used it at that time or if we were to run into this problem or a similar problem again. So practicing ethical decision making fitness is a way to ultimately promote fluency as behavior analysts. Many of us are familiar with fluency. We often program for fluency within our skill acquisition programs for our clients. Essentially, fluency refers to accuracy plus speed. And the goal with ethical decision making is to be able to quickly know what to do or at least how to respond in the moment and then be accurate in the way that you behave such that you're making a decision that aligns with your ethical standards as a professional, but that also ultimately leads to the least amount of harm being done to the least amount of people. My second recommendation is to consider the complexity of the ethical dilemma being addressed and sort of study the applicability of the decision making steps according to the complexity of the problem. So what I mean by this, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, is that there may be some ethical situations that are more versus less complex, meaning that some may be perhaps more dangerous, lead to more harm, be more serious as compared to others. And it's possible that some of these complex dilemmas maybe don't or do require all of the 11 steps versus others require less than the 11 steps or for you to take it a step further. Perhaps you can omit some steps at times. Perhaps there are situations where certain steps are critical. And so I think a preliminary step to empirically validating the model is to really pay attention to situations where we do have to address all of the steps or when we can sort of work through it in a quick in a quicker way and only go through some of the steps. Perhaps there are situations where we don't have time to work through the model and we need to solve the issue now before more harm is done and the issue worsens. And so there might be situations where perhaps the whole model is inapplicable. And in either case, we really have to begin taking a closer look at which steps may be left out at given times and keep a record of sort of the types of scenarios and complexity of scenarios that require the complete model versus perhaps an approximation of the model, kind of completing a component analysis, so to speak, of the steps included within the, the, um, the model presented from the BACB. And last, my third recommendation is to collect data throughout the process. This is really the only way in which we can start to keep data of empirical, albeit perhaps internal, anecdotal investigations of our ethical decision making as clinicians. And doing this really requires that we have an organized approach to our ethical decision making. Perhaps you have an agency specific protocol to follow when you're in an ethical situation, like perhaps you have to document things within a certain app. Perhaps you might have your own individualized way of keeping record of your ethical behaviors and how you work through ethical problems. But either way, we want to make sure that we're collecting data and that we're really going through certain steps where we're working through and identifying what it is that happened at each moment. So the data that you're collecting as you're working through ethical decisions should be to describe the ethical dilemma itself, to make a note of or document the exact model steps that you did use out of the 11, which of any were included, the outcome of each model step, like perhaps it took too long to go through all the case records, so you only looked at one thing, or perhaps, you know, there weren't other people to consult, so you left that step out, sort of documenting the outcomes of the steps. The overall outcome of the dilemma, you know, did it get resolved? It was over. Maybe some people were unhappy. Maybe some people were really pleased. And then the overall user experience. So as the clinician working through the model, what was your experience? Perhaps it was very stressful to have to go through all the steps, or perhaps it felt very supportive to have these steps to rely on. And these data can start to give us an, a, a preliminary view to 
some support related to the way that these models work, both in the outcomes that they generate, but also the experiences of the model users as they're using these tools within their own decision making. So with that, I have some closing thoughts. The closing thought to start is that our field is on the right track. The publishing of the 2020 ethics code iteration that includes a decision making model and the way that it aligns with what's available within other research definitely shows that as a field, we're moving in a direction that's supported by other fields and that's supporting us as clinicians in having a tool we can use with something as serious and as common as navigating ethical problems. Second is that we have these tools that we can use, and so we should use them. It's really easy to rely on learning history. It's kind of like, you know, you have something happen one time and you learn it. One trial learning is great, and it becomes easy to sort of revert to what's worked in the past. But we have these available models, and so we really need to ensure that we're using them. So making them easily accessible, reducing the response effort to access them, and sort of promoting their use within our supervisees, within our agency, helping ourselves access them is going to be a way to really rely on them and use them and start to see their effects. Another thing is that we don't necessarily need to, and honestly, we can't, wait for the empirical evidence. We can't sit around, we shouldn't sit around and wait for the researchers to publish the study showing that the model works so that the model can be taught. Rather, we as science practitioners ourselves have to take the step and we should take the step to start doing the investigative work, meaning take data on what is going on when we're solving these problems, the steps that I mentioned in the previous slide, start to see what types of problems we're running into, the levels of complexity, start to see if the model steps all apply, which ones don't, and start doing that work for ourselves before it's sort of provided for us and use the technologies that we know are effective generally to apply to this specific ethical decision-making operant behavior. So things like self-monitoring, fluency, data collection, we use these all the time within our practice, and we can definitely apply them to our own use of ethical decision-making and our own practice of this ethical decision-making skill. So hopefully you found this helpful and informative. That's all that I have to cover. If there's any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions that might have arisen during the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very Thank much, you, Vic. That was amazing. Folks, sure. as always, pop your questions in the chat. In the meantime, I've got one. Mm -hmm. Have you um, had an opportunity to support the BCB with this process. I mean, you know, you're you're very well equipped to provide some additional insights, considering all this lovely work that you've done. Uh, have you had a chance to maybe collaborate with them on that front and provide uh, extra suggestions, advice, and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. It's not something that we've directly done. You know, within our paper, when we published it, we did write how we noticed and recognized that the model presented by the BACB aligns with what we found. And we do definitely recommend within our paper that we continue looking to other fields as we continue to grow as our own field to get insights from what's been published in other fields and sort of what's been done before us. And it's not something that I've directly had the opportunity to collaborate with, nor have I been like invited to collaborate with, but it would be definitely something that would be really exciting to contribute to and that for sure there's space for. I mean, it looks like the BCB is doing the work. Their model definitely shows that there was some of us investigation that took place. So surely they've got something going that's sound that is relying on other literature. But it's so true that there's so much opportunity, especially when it comes to ethics, to pull from other fields and to really get insights related to what other fields have done and what's worked and not worked for fields that came before us. Hey, I've got okay. another question here. How do we um, access the manuscript? Yeah, great question. The manuscript is published in Behavior Analysis and Practice. Um, it's also, I can provide it. I'm trying to see, I'm trying to respond to the chat, but for some reason my text is like blacked out to where I can't. Um, but if you email me, I can also provide a copy. So if there's a way, I don't know if you can help me, um, Dr. Rostinas, to put my email in the chat, 
that would be a way if you want access to I it. I think so, yes. Send it. Thank sure. you so much. Yeah, I love the idea of a decision tree. Decision trees are awesome. It's really interesting to think about, you know, when I showed that bar graph of the sequ sequential versus non-sequential um, displays of models, decision trees give us sort of the option to flow through sequences in a more fluid way than sort of a step-by-step -step model. So it's cool to consider that when we have something like a tree, you know, we can kind of bounce from available options based on how we're responding to each previous, which is, aligned with what I was describing where there may be certain instances where all the steps don't necessarily apply. And so a tree sort of gives us the opportunity to see those situations where we can sort of bounce from one step to the other or make a different decision according to the type of problem at hand. Another question says, thank you, Victoria. Apologies if I missed this, but from a behavior analytic literature, were there any common ethical concerns being discussed? Yeah, that's a really great question. So what was interesting is that we actually didn't find much from behavior analytic literature. So you saw that most came, most of the literature came from fields of psychology and medicine, and they were so specific to those fields. Like there were some things that we were like, gosh, how does this even apply? You know, it's so specific to like emergency medicine or whatever it was. And when it came to behavior analytic research, it's really interesting that the most reported ethical issue within behavior analysis, um, to my knowledge, is related to supervision. So when we think about supervision, I guess it makes sense like everybody's being supervised and there's so many problems that can arise with like contracts and hours and things like that. So a very common issue appears to be, one of the most common issues within behavior analysis appears to be related to supervision practices. Also integrity is one that comes up a lot. So issues related to the integrity of the behavior analyst practice. And those are common issues that arise, all of which though can be addressed using a similar model for sure. Another question says, do these models consider cultural considerations? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we see the step of gathering available information or information gathering that definitely encompasses any cultural considerations any case specific considerations they're sort of included within that information gathering piece um, perhaps not as explicit as they should be but definitely embedded within that step Another question says, did any of the literature that uh, design models also take into account the level of experience somebody may have using these? For example, the scenarios a BCBA would encounter would be different to an RBT and therefore potentially require a slightly different model. That's a great question. And the literature that we found did not necessarily differentiate models according to experience but i think that it's definitely something worth considering you know when we think about fluency this whole accurate plus speed idea the more practice that one has with using a model or even the more experience that one has with multiple exemplar training of working through situations or scenarios we're going to see sort of an increased or stronger repertoire as compared to someone who's perhaps not had any training perhaps had some bad experiences in the past and so it's true that the models could vary according to the experience level i would say also according to the type of problem which we discussed previously and i think that's where we as practitioners really have opportunity to start collecting that data. Like what types of issues are we seeing that our RBTs are encountering versus that we're encountering as supervisors that perhaps require a different approach? What does that different approach look like? And sort of start getting some data points to back up some of these situations where we see that a different approach is warranted or even needed. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Yeah, of uh, course. Folks, I'm going I'm going to uh, deliver the oh, I've got another question. Is there any literature that also considers shorter models or how these models could be integrated uh, with in situation reflection? Some ethical scenarios may require a practitioner to reflect within the situation and may not have the time to go and think about it. 
Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, you know, kind of what we were talking about is there may be situations that are so pressing that you don't have time to go through the whole model. Like it needs to be solved as quickly as possible type of thing. And it, it the, from the findings, you know, when you think of that slide where we had the percentages of papers that included the various steps, we see that not every paper included every step. Now what's, in, this is actually really interesting. I'm glad this question came out. It's a great question. What's really interesting is that from our review, so when we went through the 60 articles, there was not a single article out of the 60 that included all nine of the common steps until the BACB published theirs and theirs did align with all nine steps. So when we saw that side by side of the BACB model versus the common steps, the BACB model was the only one out of all the decision making models, ethical decision making models that we reviewed that actually aligned with all nine steps. Some of them only had six, only had four, only had five, had seven, whatever, but they didn't all have all nine. So definitely that shows that there may be situations where we don't need all nine. However, given that none of these have been empirically investigated and that there's no like empirical evidence behind them, we just don't know. So that's why we're at a point where we don't really have time to wait for the empirical investigations. We kind of have to start doing that work ourselves and start to collect data on what types of problems perhaps do warrant use of all 11 steps versus the types of problems that we can omit some steps from or that require some more immediate action. And it's, it's sort of like we just don't have that information right now. That is a very valid point, and it's interesting to see that the BACB is so thorough. Potentially, the, you know, I suppose it might be also the, re the result of many of the criticisms we have about the historical applications of our field. So um, oh, yeah. I'm glad to hear That's that. That's music to my ears, to be honest. For sure. Mm -hmm. Folks, I added Victoria's email in the chat. It's there for you if you want to uh, get in touch about the um, paper. I've also uh, added the feedback form. I'm also going to now add this. Oh, you just muted yourself, Dr. Rustinus. Full body error, sorry. So as I was saying, you have the feedback form uh, in the chat. Now I've just posted the CU form. The last keyword is fluency. Um, uh, Victoria, it, it, it was not on purpose, but um, you know, I was I was almost um, jubilant about the fact that people are talking about fluency. This is my, oh, no this is my passion. So it happened to be the last keyword. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, incredible. I was like, oh my. Yeah, I was like, OK, you know, great man stick alike. So fa fabulous. Um, so folks, the last keyword is fluency. Uh, please access the CU form now because once I shut down Teams, you won't have access to the link. So please make sure you clicked on it. So it's sitting in your browser uh, for you to then fill out the relevant keywords. Victoria, thank you very, very much for today. We thoroughly appreciate it. The engagement was amazing. I think it goes without saying that, you know, you, you, you've noticed how many questions you had, so you, you don't need me to tell you that people were interested. Thank you so much. Folks, thank you for uh, for joining as well. Uh, I know it's a bank holiday here in the United Kingdom, so we're not supposed to be working, you know, but uh, no rest for the wicked, no slacking, folks. We've got <laughs> ethics to, to discuss. Come on, then. Uh, so thanks again, Vic, and hopefully uh, we will have you back at some point to discuss uh, more of your research with us. Of course. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who took the time out, especially on a holiday to be here. I mean, I know we're all very motivated to get our ethics CEUs, so I'm sure that helped, but it was really great. And I appreciated all of the questions. Thanks for your engagement and thanks for the opportunity. Take care, everybody. I'll see you around. Cheers.